housing crisis is wreaking havoc nationally. Our podcast discusses how it is playing out specifically in Black Berkeley, California, chronicling the lived experiences behind what people call gentrification, detailing our endeavor for our right to stay and our right to return, brought to you by Healthy Black Families. I am your host, Deb, and this is Telling Our Stories, The Housing Chronicles. Welcome. We are lucky to have Alan Dones here in this last part of our three-part interview. In the previous two episodes, you shared, Alan, some of the obstacles and lessons which paved the road to you becoming a large-scale developer. You also highlighted the importance of when and how engaging the community as an integral part of development happens. So now, let's talk about who can be a developer. Um, Are there prerequisites to becoming a developer? Most people think developers are the people with money that just come in and that the prerequisite to becoming a developer is having money to put up something big. Who can be a developer? What are the prerequisites to becoming one? Well, um, yes, the prerequisite to being a developer um, and that when I say being a developer, I'm saying not only someone who attempts to develop it, but someone who actually achieves a ribbon cutting of a brand new, shiny new building. The pre- one of the prerequisites is capital and access to capital. And now, to all people that develop, have capital, themselves? No, not necessarily. Some do, many do not. Um, They have all access to capital. They may not have capital themselves. There's a distinction between having access to capital and having their own capital. And so with that said, you know, we have to also understand that Again, my development uh, participation that I've chosen to get involved with um, is scale, development of scale, you know, multi-unit buildings, bigger office buildings, you know. That's what industry that I have chosen to participate in. Um, now there's some aspects of it that I've been somewhat effective and successful at some that, uh, I have not and somewhere the jury is still out. Um, but at scale, you definitely are going to be dependent 99% of the time on having access to capital. And when you look at the Oakland skyline, for example, or the Berkeley skyline, and all these new shiny cranes that go up and the shiny buildings that come out of it, um, and you look at what capital is building that. Is it the capital of some high net worth person like a Warren Buffett, for example, that just reaches into their pocket and funds the whole thing? No, that's not the paradigm. What it typically is are managed institutional capital, what they call institutional investment. That is the money of pension funds, public pension funds, private pension funds, the money of insurance companies, of banks, And when you think about the source of that capital, the source of that capital really includes everybody that lives in a community, everybody that pays taxes, everybody that works in a community that basically has a pension. They are the ultimate source of the funding. 
but their funding often gets managed by others. And that means that they may be the source of the capital, but they're not necessarily, they don't necessarily have access to the capital. So for me in development, as a black developer um, in the Bay Area, I would say that the biggest challenge that much more qualified developers even than me have is having access to capital and having access even to our capital, our own capital, access to our own, you know, the pension funds of our community members, you know, as well as, you know, our taxpayers. If, if we're talking about the pension funds of teachers, teacher salaries get paid with our tax dollars. If we're talking about the pension funds of police officers and firefighters, their salaries get paid with our tax dollars. Their funds go into big pools of capital that have to be invested. Otherwise, when they retire and they expect to have their benefits, there'll be unfunded obligations. That money has to be invested. And um, so that money has to be invested somewhere. Where does it get invested? It gets invested in our skyline for one of many different areas, but that's one of the biggest areas that it gets invested in, the private equities in the real estate world. It's one of the biggest areas it gets invested in and that people don't know. I had no idea until I was prepping for this. I will embarrassingly say, and with some level of humiliation, that I was far too long a developer before I even realized that. <laughs> you know, I was actually per- participating in this field because I saw these buildings going up and I said, hey, I want to be part of that, you know, and I got involved without necessarily knowing that those buildings were being built with some of my own money. You know, my mom being a school teacher in the Oakland Unified mm-hmm. School te- District for 40 years. And every two weeks Mm -hmm. when she got her check, there was an incremental amount that was put into a pension fund. My mom was also married to a black contractor and black developer. And at the end of the day, unlike her white counterpart in the classroom next to her, who might have also been married to a white contractor, her husband, her family, didn't have access to that recycling of the dollars that her white counterpart necessarily had. Yeah, into her community. Right, right. Right. And so the the experiences, while they had the same careers, same financial arrangement, they had very different financial outcomes at the end of their uh, their professional career when they retired, you know, One person decided that she could live her dream and open up a goat yoga studio where basically they have goats that walk on your back. And the other person just was, you know, hoping to be able to still afford to live in the community that they lived out their life in and hoping to be able to afford it. So these are the things that we have to become aware of. Like to your point, once I started and as I've become more aware of this reality, the other thing I'm becoming aware of is that most of us simply just don't know. We don't know. And that's by design. There's reasons why we don't know. So that money can move in the way that those in power want it to move. Yeah. And to understand these things. That's going to have to be by design, too. Right. Here we are. It's going to be. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so let's dive into what's the relationship of racism and land use and how do we make inroads within the system? Well, racism shows up, again, in multifaceted ways. I think, you know, this is really philosophical and all that, but I do believe that until the greater society 
starts to realize that inequality is a risk to every single person on the planet, including people that are living quote unquote comfortable lifestyles, you know, until they start to really see it in their best interest to address inequality and the underlying racism that causes it, then um, we're going to just continue to struggle. That, you know, we had as a result of George Floyd moment. Right. Some people here in California thought, oh, you know, with all this public outrage and sentiment, you know, uh, this is a good time to repeal Proposition 209, which was the uh, legislation that killed affirmative action, or it was a voter referendum that really killed affirmative action and things in California that were actually starting to level the playing field in terms of accessibility to opportunity. And they tried to put measures on the ballot, measure think 15 and 16 to repeal Proposition 209. I did not see one advertisement against the Proposition 16. I saw a lot of advertising on TV in support of it, but yet and still it went down in flames because a majority of the voters voted their self-interest. You know, they might have been talking a good game even when they were being polled, but they voted their self-interest. And that's a problem. I think that my white neighbors, who I happen to know and love, I don't think that they really yet have embraced the threat and the risk that they are exposed to as a result of the inequality that is existing in Oakland, in this community, or in Berkeley. They have not, to me, they're the proverbial frog laying in the slowly warming pot of water. And they have a real risk and there's a clear and present danger that they're not yet fully uh, aware of. And it's a danger to their quality of life, to their future economy, economic interests. It's a danger to their health. It's a danger to their safety and security. And All you have to do is really become more aware of it and you start to see it everywhere. And so I think that for me, as I go about this business of real estate development, I have to start there. I have to start with not expecting just because it's a fair and moral thing to do that people are going to come around and do it. I have to start knowing that Until the people that have access to my mom's pension money understand that it's in their best interest that that money be equitably managed, then I'm not going to have access to it. You know, it's going to be a battle that's going to go on and on. And it may be my great great grandkids who finally have some kind of breakthrough. And by the way, I don't even have any kids yet. (laughs) So, you know. So that's the reality. So racism, you know, is able to be cloaked here in California because it's uh, able to, in real estate development, it's able to be overshadowed by other things that camouflage it. You know, like the fact that we don't meet the capital criteria that banks put on us to be able to receive loans for the real estate that we want to buy. Uh, And why don't we meet it? Because we don't have access to my mom's pension money. But, you know, we're not able to connect those dots enough. So we get dismissed. We feel self-conscious. We get embarrassed because we don't meet that criteria that the banks put on us. People are judgmental because of us because we don't meet that criteria. We're too self-critical. And that's just because we're not knowledgeable. We have to start to address um, the fact that this is a risk to everybody, not just us. We have to make sure that we can clearly show it, document it, articulate it. It's really clear. It's not even 
you know, it it may sound self-interested, but it's real science. You know, the science will support it. It's just not enough people are measuring the science right now. And real estate uh, prejudice shows up now when, for example, uh, somebody looks at my offering as a black developer and they don't, they see that maybe my graphic arts that I presented to the public don't have all that clear, you know, sparkle that my white counterpart might have. You know, I might be judged not only by white people for that, but I get judged by my own community. And sometimes my community judges themselves based on how I'm showing up. But I happen to know that he has my mom's pension money and he could afford a graphic artist. I had to do my own (laughs) graphic arts and work a little harder. And so, you know, it may be beautiful to me. Uh, These are the things that are show up as racism. When we turn in our plans to the planning uh, department at the city of Berkeley and some planner is sitting there looking at the look and feel of our documentation, the quality of it. And you have one guy who has my mom's pension money who's being able to produce those documents with access to that capital which not only included the capital that came from his community that he really only needed, but it included more capital. He had an overabundance of it. And therefore, you know, he had so much wind at his back that maybe what he ultimately worked on wasn't any, anywhere near the effort that was needed. But at the end of the day, that planner is sitting there and he's arriving at conclusions when he compares his outcome to my outcome. Racism, you know, when it's an insurance company, when it's a tenant, when it's, uh, um, you know, someone that I'm looking to buy their property or sell property to. So these are the things that we have to continue to evolve our knowledge and understanding. We have great critical thinkers, great practitioners. We have to give them the tools that they need so that their talents can be of benefit to everybody. Right. And your, you know, your response also brings up a point for me about decolonizing our minds, right? Since when did the presentation of a project looks become the importance versus what's actually in that plan? How do we get here? Right. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) There's a lot of work to be done. I think there's one other really important point that specifically applies to North Berkeley, South Berkeley, uh, Oakland, the region, is that we have historically been the spark of the critical thinking that has sparked revolution. And it's been across a range of industries not the least of which being real estate, but also, you know, just in terms of, you know, how we look at life and the world. Yes. And that has also been deep intimidation. We have to keep in mind that what we're talking about is launching this major campaign and effort in the uh, ground zero of the counterintelligence program, COINTELPRO, that was basically uh, very, very highly financed in this exact community to thwart Black progress achievement. And, And so as a result, you know, we don't have and we have not had the benefit of even of truth and reconciliation that really gets to the bottom of how many different ways this shows up including the colonialized or the, you know, Willie Lynch type, you know, thinking that we're all still in some ways suffering from. And it's not to be stuck in the past, but it's really to bring to the surface. Sankofa. Yeah. If we don't look back, how can we look forward? Yeah. Sankofa. What you just said is a perfect segue into what all of this is about, which is 
what Healthy Black Families calls equity for Black Berkeley, um, but what is also known through the city of Berkeley as equitable Black Berkeley. So let me ask you, Alan, what is equity for Black Berkeley as you see it, this project? Well, when it comes to, if we're talking about, for example, development of the Ashby BART station, for example, or any of the BART stations, but in particular that, I think that we have to really have as our North, North Pole uh, this um, concept that the development of that site needs to be reflective of the community, of the demographic of the community in terms of the participation at all levels. And we're not only talking about the affordable housing, but we're talking about, you know, the market rate housing. We're talking about the offices, you know, the retail spaces on the ground floor. We're talking about any and everything that gets built and done with that property. And every stage of the development, from the pre-development right on through to the property management, the ownership, and the transfer of that ownership. It has to be based on our holistic participation that uh, basically um, is part of the DNA that manifests when that project is built. And, and that's saying a lot, but that's, to me, that's what equitable Berkeley is. That's what we have to use as our true north. But then one other important thing that it represents too is that it's not just about equitable Black Berkeley. It's about equitable region because we live within a region and, you know, we're not going to be able to have a sustainable economic presence here if it's only dependent upon South Berkeley or Berkeley at all. The, and the fact that that project happens to be potentially built on a regional transit system is really a blessing and it can provide many, many uh, pathways, many different ways for us to gain a foothold that allows us to sell our services, our goods, as well as uh, have access to the market dynamics of the region and not just the neighborhood. So we have to, we have, we live, we live in a region, you know, and, um, and, and that's, that's a very, very, to me, fundamental and important concept that we have to embrace. Yes. Equity for Black Berkeley is shooting for the moon and it, it must be uh, because that's what we have to do to, we have to really use our imagination and look beyond and what's sad about all this is I feel like these are things that should have been thought about and should have been happening eons ago. But because of the way the system has been laid out and has been operating for so long, now it seems like we're shooting for the moon. When in reality, we're putting in place what should have been so long ago. Yeah, it's it's true, you know, but a lot of us don't have enough appreciation for what was invested to keep us from continuing our forward progress. You know, now, uh, you know, as we pass 40, 50, 60 years, things are starting to more increasingly be declassified, if you will. More scholars are starting to write books and provide a more accurate account and one thing that never ceases to amaze me and surprise me was the depth and level of, of investment that was made by the federal government in this particular neighborhood to thwart our forward progress. And it wasn't only made to block the Black Panther Party. These were investments that were made to basically upend any type of organized effort, whether it was the Urban League, the Black Chambers of Commerce, the Black Panthers, the Black Contractors, the Black 
doctors, <laughs> you know. We had actual heavy investment in the tens of millions of dollars to basically go in, surveil covertly, and then reintroduce misinformation to upend us. And there was just enough truth in the lies to make us believe in the words that were coming, get us fighting against each other. Another reason why regionalization is an important thing for us to look at, because part of that process, which all the counterintelligence was doing, was adopting Willie Lynch type tactics. But one of the things that happens here regionally is we tend to look at ourselves in silos. And then we get into this thing where, you know, if, if, uh, North Berkeley succeeds, it's at the expense of black people in South Berkeley. If South Berkeley succeeds, it's at the expense of people in West Oakland. West Oakland is at the expense of East Oakland. And the, the siloed mentality that keeps us in this crabs in the barrel mentality. Stop. It's time to stop that thinking and get outside of it and understand that there are a lot of people that are still walking among us that played a critical role in perpetuating it and continues to. And, and we have to, you know, really kind of be reasonable and understand that some people were coerced. Some people did things without knowing it. They played a role. Some people betrayed their community, but they betrayed because they were worried about feeding their family or they had some fear. You know, that investment played on every single vulnerability that we had. And most of us had no idea the level and the extent that it was happening here. So we're living with the reverberations to this day of a lot of that poison that was put into our community. And we have to be knowledgeable as we go forward. We're going to have to stop because we break each other's hearts. And, you know, as part of the momentum of this and, and we're going to have to be aware and knowledgeable. Uh, and, and, uh, that's, that's what's going to hopefully bring about health and recovery and basically you know, some ex some examples that all mankind could use to create a better world. Absolutely. So who's going to benefit? Everybody's going to benefit. Healthier economy, uh, better environment, you know, bigger piece of pie for everybody, you know. And that's that's what a holistic economy yields. And that's yes. what we have to work on. Absolutely. Umbutu. Thank you so much, Alan Dones. It's been a real pleasure having you on Telling Our Stories podcast, The Housing Chronicles. You've laid down a lot of knowledge, not just in the nuts and bolts of understanding what development is, but also the behind the scenes in the organizing parts that we have to make headway in. So I thank you so much for joining us and for making the time and absolutely look forward to our work together. I am so, so grateful and encouraged to be part of this. I'm encouraged that it's even happening and people with your level of passion and caring as well as ability to grasp these concepts are much better than me. <laughs> it's taken me way too long. And that's just a point of, of great encouragement, you know, of going forward and knowing that we will be part of this, this, this economic bonanza that's going to happen because of the fact we're part of it. So I'm excited about it. And thank you so much for including me. Written, edited, and hosted by Deborah Hailu, Telling Our Stories Program Coordinator at Healthy Black Families, Inc. Audio engineered by Adrian Davis and Salim Najee Ula of One Hitter Entertainment. Shout out to James Shields of Creative Shields for our beautiful podcast artwork. 
Akila Shaheed, Office of Media Manager at Healthy Black Families, Inc., for the many ways she steps up and bridges our gaps. And Wilhelmina Wilson, Executive Director at Healthy Black Families, Inc., for bringing all of this together. Casting out the net of Black love in service of all humanity, this has been Telling Our Stories, The Housing Chronicles. See you next time.